Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Day three, Apparel, Tech, uh, Apparel Textile Sourcing Virtual. First time doing this. Um, this is day three of our seminar series. Um, I've just a couple of notes before I introduce our speaker. Uh, we do have a chat box, so if you have any questions that, that would arise during um, his presentation, please feel free to put them all on there, and we'll address them at the very end. Um, also, these slides will be available to anybody who has, is uh, registered to, our, to receive our emails, so we will send a link to the ATS SlideShare once we've compiled everybody's presentations. Um, our speaker today is Rich Harper. Um, the title of his talk is How an Uncertain Trade Environment is Impacting the Industries of Apparel and Footwear and How the Industry is Responding. Rich is the Manager of International Trade at Outdoor Industry Association. Rich, thanks for being with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Really happy to be here and join you all for this uh, presentation. Uh, as Jason mentioned, I'm Manager of International Trade for Outdoor Industry Association. We're a national trade association of 1,300 outdoor manufacturers, retailers, and suppliers from across the country. We're based in, in Boulder, Colorado. I'm actually based uh, in the Washington, D.C. office, although I'm doing this presentation today from my home office uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, so an auxiliary office for uh, Outdoor Industry Association. Um, I wanted to start with just give you a little background about our, our trade program and our members. We represent a diverse group of membership uh, from some of the globally recognized brands to small mom and pop shops that you find on uh, Main Street USA. Uh, we represent manufacturers uh, that produce domestically and we represent companies that uh, utilize global value chains to uh, bring product to market. As I often point out to Congress and administration, our domestic manufacturers are also utilizing uh, global value chains uh, for their inputs. Uh, we are, the emphasis of our trade program is centered around what we call a balanced trade agenda. Um, and again, I'm from Washington, D.C., so I am an advocate for the industry on Capitol Hill. Um, and our balanced trade agenda simply means that we support uh, the elimination of import tariffs on outdoor products where there is no viable uh, domestic production. And for our Made in USA members, we support policies to help them uh, compete in a global economy. Uh, what we're trying to do for both members is to ensure the U.S. federal trade policy fosters a stable, predictable environment for all outdoor businesses, and that has proved particularly challenging uh, over the past three years. Ultimately, our goal is the same for importers and domestic manufacturers alike. We want to lower costs uh, for outdoor businesses and consumers, get more people outdoors who enjoy the, uh, the great outdoors. We've seen a number of key wins in our trade program over the past several years that have really impacted uh, the bottom line uh, of our members. Uh, we help lead the effort to add travel goods to the generalized system of preferences. This is the main trade preference program for developing countries, and I'll touch on that in my presentation. Backpacks, sports bags now can enter the U.S. duty-free if they're sourced uh, from a GSP beneficiary company, a uh, country. Uh, we help uh, with the creation of protective active footwear lines uh, in the tariff schedule, so lowering the import tariff on a group of outdoor footwear products from 37.5% to 20%. We sponsored a series of miscellaneous tariff bills, and these are uh, bills that suspend or lower the duty on a particular group of, of products uh, for a three-year period. So we've had significant gains uh, in the trade program, helping our members uh, with their bottom line. I did want to sort of highlight what really sets this uh, industry apart uh, in the apparel, footwear uh, space in particular. Um, our members are engaged in the manufacturing of high-tech, innovative uh, apparel and footwear designed to withstand the rigors of outdoor recreation. Um, so recreation performance outerwear is one example. We help lead the effort to create uh, performance outerwear, these lines in the, the tariff schedule, um, to set them apart from other ready-made mass market apparel. So for recreation performance outerwear, it has to be water resistant, it has to have critically sealed seams, and it has to have a series of other uh, criteria in order for it to qualify as recreation performance outerwear. So, it shows uh, if you match these standards, this is really unique, innovative, uh, high-tech apparel, which also uh, can face import tariffs between 7% and 27.5%, so significantly uh, high import tariffs. Uh, I mentioned travel goods and adding travel goods to GSP. The motivation behind that effort really was around uh, the import tariffs that a lot of travel goods face. As you can see here, uh, they range from backpacks, 17.6% of backpacks, 20% uh, on, on some duffel bags. Uh, luggage can range from 6 to 20 percent. 
Uh, so these are significant uh, import tariffs uh, on these products. And so as I mentioned, our goal is to help these companies uh, lower uh, their costs. But this is the kind of gear uh, that is essential for outdoor recreation. Um, I mentioned the protective active footwear lines. This is sort of an example of why we got involved in that effort. You see uh, the athletic footwear product on the left has a duty rate of 24%. But at the time, if you added a waterproof breathable liner to help with uh, outdoor uh, recreation, uh, trekking, uh, trail running, um, if you added that waterproof breathable liner essential for protecting your feet in the elements, the tariff went up to 37.5%. Uh, so that we engage in that initiative to classify uh, those products as protective active footwear. And here's the definition uh, that we succeeded in creating. Um, again, showing that these products, if it has a waterproof breathable liner um, designed for outdoor recreation uh, should have a lower tariff rate. Um, so there was a significant reduction in that tariff, but again, the, the 20% tariff remained. Um, so where we are in the trade program of the past several years is dealing with a lot of uncertainty and dealing with a lot of higher costs. Um, the president, uh, campaigned on getting tough with our trading partners, in particular China, um, and he has certainly remained true to that uh, in, in office. Um, the U.S. Trade Representative uh, initiated an investigation into China's uh, IP practices at the outset of the administration and issued reports to the, to the president that China was, in fact, undermining uh, U.S. IP through thing, practices like forced technology transfers and recommend that the president impose punitive tariffs in response uh, to compel the Chinese to come to the table, negotiate a solution to address some of these concerns. The, the, the president's preferred medium to getting the information across about trade policy is via Twitter. And this is something that our, our companies have had to uh, deal with, is getting announcements such as this one um, on an escalation in the U.S.-China trade war, uh, and an escalation in punitive tariffs applied uh, to products coming out of China, and having to respond. So this is the, the preferred medium of getting for uh, getting information across. Um, and so it, it, it's a challenge for outdoor uh, companies, I think, just to, to stay on top of this information and understand the full implications at times of some of these announcements. Um, so what the, the result of the, the US-China trade war um, ultimately has been significantly higher costs for outdoor companies. So just to back up a little bit, uh, after the president's, uh, as for after the US Trade Representative's Office issued the report, the president uh, went through with four rounds of tariffs uh, on products. So punitive tariffs were placed on certain groups of products coming out of China. As I'll get into, outdoor uh, products were really caught up on that third list, the third list of products, and then some apparel and footwear uh, were hit by the list four. Um, and so as I mentioned, a lot of these products are already facing significantly import tariffs. And now if they come out of China, they have a punitive tariff uh, on top of that. So raising the costs uh, for outdoor companies and creating a lot of uncertainty uh, for these businesses. Uncertainty about if there are more tariffs will come into effect. Uncertainty if those tariffs will be raised. Uncertainty about when uh, the tariffs uh, may come off. Um, so that's significant impact then with these higher costs uh, on jobs, innovation, new product development. So the higher uh, import tariffs that our members are, are paying, that's less money for new jobs, less money to develop uh, new products, less money to explore new business opportunities. And we've stressed to the administration that uh, this has also had an impact on domestic manufacturing, which is certainly a priority of this administration is to revitalize domestic manufacturing. As I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of our members do utilize um, domestic manufacturers, utilize inputs um, that go into the, the manufactured product domestically. And those inputs, if they're sourced from China, some have been hit by punitive tariffs. So costs have also been raised uh, for domestic manufacturers. Our members have had to face the, the challenge of trying to absorb uh, many of these higher costs um, and avoid passing them on to their consumers. They've engaged in uh, conversations with their, their partners uh, in China. In some cases, uh, have agreed to, to split the higher costs or that the vendor in China may absorb the higher costs. But they've really have tried to bend over backwards um, to, to try and avoid um, passing those higher costs on to the consumers. But the longer stay on, the harder that has been uh, to avoid uh, passing that cost on to the consumer. So ultimately the consumer uh, is, will pay. Um, even if a member was looking to uh, move the supply chain out of China to avoid some of these higher tariffs, it certainly can't, couldn't be done within weeks or months um, and even years. Um, so members have tried to look at those options and explore those options, but certainly it's taken time and more successful, they still had to pay uh, the higher costs as a result of, of, the, of the trade war. 
So this is just a snapshot of the, the third list of products that were hit. So the president imposed initially a 10% tariff on $200 billion worth of products um, that included outdoor products like backpacks, uh, leather ski gloves, bikes, should have also included on this slide, uh, camp chairs and hats were also included on those lists. So hit with a 10% tariff that ultimately went up uh, to 25%. The fourth list of products covered really the bread and butter of the industry, apparel, footwear, and a number of equipment. Uh, um, so it, it, the fourth list in total covered $300 billion worth of products. It was split up into uh, 4A and 4B. So the top part of the slide covers 4A, a group of apparel, uh, footwear, uh, equipment like tents and skis, uh, snowboards. Um, they were initially hit with a 15% uh, punitive tariff in 2019, which as I'll get into, uh, went down to 7.5%. There was gonna be another round of tariffs applied to the so-called list 4B, which covered another group of outdoor apparel and footwear products. Um, that was set to come into effect last December, but ultimately uh, was postponed. Um, so this graph shows really the, the impact of what this all means. The import tariffs paid significantly went up uh, for outdoor companies. And so the tariffs are essentially taxes. So cost, taxes went, and costs went way up. So you can see this only applies to the, that third group of products. It doesn't even cover outdoor apparel and footwear. But you saw that from January to October 2019, tariffs paid on list three uh, were 2.7 out of China, $2.7 billion. And compare that to 2018, the same time period in 2018, uh, it was $1.1 billion paid. In 2017, $873 million paid. So tariffs on affected products coming out of China on list three went way up uh, for outdoor companies. So as I mentioned, that this means less money for new jobs, new product development, new business opportunities. So really a significant negative impact uh, on the bottom line for outdoor companies. As I said, I'm from Washington, D.C., so lobbying is my bread and butter. And so this is just a snapshot of some of the advocacy that we did uh, testifying before the administration opposition to the, the new tariffs, putting on a series of webinars uh, for our members on uh, the exclusion process that was set up. The administration set up an exclusion process to give companies and stakeholders the opportunity to make the case that their products should be excluded from the punitive tariffs. Um, we've also did webinars on various tariff mitigation strategies um, to help outdoor companies uh, mitigate the impact of the tariffs. We released monthly tariff uh, data, as you saw from uh, that previous slide, and we significant congressional administration engagement, bringing uh, some of our companies and executives to the Hill in opposition to these tariffs, and working in, as a part of a broader coalition, American for Free Trade. Um, we put together a series of uh, social media tools. We put together a total tariff video uh, for members of Congress, highlighting the impact that the tariffs are having uh, on outdoor companies via a series of social media channels. We also put together a supply chain at then DC for members of Congress and the administration and staff highlighting the impact of these tariffs on each of the steps of the supply chain uh, for a particular group of outdoor products and a significant media engagement using the media to amplify our voice. And this is just a snapshot of some of the coverage uh, that we received. Uh, we had a reporter from CNBC uh, trail of myself and a group of outdoor executives on the Hill. Up in the upper right corner, you see that the hang tag that Columbia Sportswear put together a, a leave behind for uh, congressional offices, again, showing the impact uh, that the tariffs uh, can have uh, on retail prices. So a real great tool um, to raise the awareness about the impact that tariffs had on outdoor companies. So this is just an overview of where things stand right now. Um, the administration in China did sign what they called a phase one deal in January. Uh, suspending that fourth uh, B, 4B uh, group uh, of products that were going to be hit by a punitive tariff. List 4A was reduced from 15 to 7.5%. But the phase two negotiations are very much on hold. U.S.-China relations are uh, at a low at this point. The tensions are high. Um, the administration, uh, the president's also spoken of possibly um, leaving uh, the phase one deal or imposing additional um, sanctions on China. Uh, so, the, the, the negotiations that we'd hoped that we'd, we'd begin in earnest uh, to resolve all outstanding issues and remove remaining punitive tariffs are very much on hold. And what I've advised members is that these tariffs are likely to extend into 2021, regardless of what happens uh, in November. A new administration is still going to want China to take certain actions uh, to protect USIP, change some of its policies in order to lift these punitive tariffs. So these punitive tariffs are likely to remain in place for the foreseeable future. So that means, again, a 25% punitive tariff on list three products, such as backpacks, bikes, camp chairs, and hats. 
and a 7.5% on the list 4A, some apparel, footwear, and equipment. 4B remains suspended for now, but as I've emphasized to members, um, that, that 4B was suspended, it wasn't canceled. And if uh, the relations deteriorate, if the trade war ramps up again, we could still see um, those products on 4B hit by punitive tariffs. I mentioned there's an exclusion process to uh, resolve, uh, to address some concerns um, from companies um, about products that they can only get from China. So the administration set up a process um, that would allow uh, stakeholders to file petitions to, to make the case that these products should be exempt from punitive tariffs for a year. Um, and we've seen some key wins in those space on some bikes, some helmets, um, and uh, some, group, uh, some backpacks. So some relief in that area from the punitive tariffs. Uh, we also see uh, th th those exclusions that are set to expire that have been in place for a year. Uh, the administration is accepting comments to extend um, those, uh, those exclusions for an additional year. And I'll get into a discussion on the tariff deferral, which is a part of uh, our industry's response to the COVID-19 outbreak. The products affected by the China 301 tariffs were excluded um, from the 90-day tariff deferral. So on top of this U.S.-China trade war that was impacting the bottom line of outdoor companies and, and creating a lot of uncertainty uh, for those members uh, that source products from China, uh, we had to deal with the COVID-19 outbreak, which has moved certainly uh, from China beyond uh, uh, to trading partners around the world. Um, you know, the initial feedback that our companies got from the, the, from on, on this issue is that their, their partners, their vendors uh, in China, their factories were closed, the workers were at home. Um, so was, um, there's a lot of uncertainty about when uh, any orders uh, would be shipped and what the ultimate impact would be uh, on those supply chains, how disrupted uh, those supply chains would be. Um, for members that were looking to um, shift supply chains and looking to travel to the region or elsewhere uh, to explore new opportunities, travel course had been suspended. Um, and closer to home, of course, retail outlets uh, in most of the country have been, have been closed. Um, there have been furloughs and, and layoffs, um, a number of outdoor companies. And we've also seen the issue of excess inventory. So members that were able to bring product in uh, to the U.S. with retail outlets closed are sitting on a lot of excess inventory uh, in some cases. Which, so this, the COVID-19 outbreak and the challenges presented there, uh, the disruptions to the supply chain, um, were challenges on top of what they've already been facing uh, as they're dealing with the blows of, of, of the U.S.-China trade war. So to really emphasize again the need uh, to explore uh, new, new sourcing options. And as I think certainly will be a priority uh, for a number of outdoor companies as we get through at least the COVID-19 part of uh, this challenge and perhaps the, the, the punitive tariffs as a result of the U.S.-China trade war uh, will remain. Um, before I get into the discussion of you know, some of the other new opportunities, I did also want to touch again briefly on this 90-day uh, tariff deferral um, that the administration implemented uh, for March and April imports. Uh, this was to help um, companies, importers, uh, preserve cash flow and liquidity uh, as they're dealing with uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, the, the administration's decision, however, excluded any products that were subject to trade remedy actions, and that included products affected by the China 301 tariffs. So those products were not eligible for the 90-day tariff deferral. In addition, the administration included a hardship provision. So you had to show that your sales were down um, by 40% if you were to qualify. And the, the exclusion of the China 301 products and the, the hardship provision were really a re result of opposition from labor and domestic manufacturers to any tariff deferral altogether. So the administration tried to thread the needle. It's been a mixed bag uh, for outdoor companies. Some had been able to utilize the tariff deferral and were able to, to preserve uh, that liquidity. Uh, others uh, were not able to, to meet the hardship provision um, and others were excluded because they had products affected by uh, China 301 tariffs. So it really was you know, a mixed bag of who was able uh, to benefit. Um, so we'll be engaged in an effort uh, to push for additional rounds uh, of deferral. And one other point I should make is that the administration's announcement was made on a Sunday night. Um, and so a lot of companies had tariff payments due that Monday. So to be able to turn the announcement around, get the information out to those companies and be able to get in touch with their customs brokers to take advantage of this program in some cases was challenging. So we are gonna make the case uh, that the additional tariff uh, deferral round should be implemented again to help uh, these companies respond to COVID-19, preserve that liquidity, preserve that cash flow uh, so they, they can emerge um, uh, from this crisis. 
But as I mentioned, uh, companies were already taking a look at, because of the US-China trade war, we're taking a look at uh, new sourcing opportunities and looking for new sourcing options. Um, and COVID-19 on top of the, the, the US-China trade war has really emphasized um, the need to uh, diversify uh, supply chains. And I, so I think you'll see um, additional, um, uh, additional work uh, to explore new sourcing options, again, when outdoor companies and other companies get through uh, this crisis. Um, and one program that we have emphasized to members, especially those engaged in travel goods, is the generalized system of preferences. Again, this is the main trade preference program for developing countries. Eligible items enter uh, the U.S. duty-free if they come from a, a beneficiary uh, country. Uh, it is a congressionally authorized program, so it will expire at the end of the year. It needs to be renewed by Congress, so we're certainly part of that lobbying effort to make sure that the program is renewed. Um, but just to show that the, the, the benefits of uh, adding travel goods to GSP. The past year saw 100, over $120 million in duty savings on travel goods uh, coming from GSP countries. Um, so that's duty savings that can go into uh, new job hires, uh, new product development, um, and really a strong impact uh, on the bottom line for a lot of outdoor companies. And we've stressed the administration when asked, you know, where have you, where have you seen success uh, and members shifting their supply chains out of China? We can point to adding travel goods uh, to GSP as one area where we have seen that success. And because it was because there was that incentive uh, to move those supply chains uh, to countries like Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Cambodia. And I'll highlight um, you know, some of the trends there um, shortly. Um, and we, uh, we also working on an initiative for, to make footwear eligible to, uh, to GSP for the first time. So we're working on a piece of legislation that would make a, a, that would make a certain group of footwear, outdoor footwear products eligible for GSP and you know, talking with our members that manufacture domestically so that we're not covering products uh, that they produce. Um, apparel, unfortunately, is also still uh, excluded um, from the GSP program. Um, but travel goods is one area where we have seen significant growth uh, in uh, this in, in, in sourcing uh, outside of China, and we're working uh, to do the same for footwear. I um, also stress to our members that the U.S. does maintain a series of free trade agreements. Um, the well, top priority of the administration was to renegotiate the NAFTA agreement. Um, so USMCA is uh, set to come into effect on July 1. Uh, we're successful um, in maintaining duty-free, reciprocal duty-free market access for outdoor apparel, footwear, and equipment. Uh, the administration has also revised the Korea-U.S. free trade agreements, not to the same extent uh, as the NAFTA agreement. Uh, the Korea-U.S. Um, uh, changes were not subject to congressional approval. Uh, the U.S. has engaged in uh, negotiations with Japan, which resulted in a, a phase one deal, um, and the work now has begun on uh, phase two, which we hope phase two would cover uh, products in our space and the outdoor apparel, footwear, and equipment space, again, with the goal of reciprocal duty-free um, market access. And to highlight one area of strong interest of ours uh, in U.S.-Japan would be uh, making U.S.-made leather footwear, uh, greater market access opportunities for U.S.-made leather footwear in, in Japan. CAFTA and Colombia are two other countries, uh, or CAFTA group of Central American countries in Colombia where uh, the U.S. maintains free trade agreements and the U.S. has also launched um, free trade negotiations with the U.K. The challenge for some of these partners is to ensure that they have this, the, the workforce training and the infrastructure for the kind of innovative high-tech apparel and footwear um, and, and equipment that our, our members create. So that is, uh, I think, a challenge that a lot of our members will, will see in, in, in some of these countries. Um, and so, but uh, with uh, the incentives of duty-free uh, treatment, um, we hope to see some growth in those areas uh, for uh, apparel uh, and footwear. So I wanted to just conclude um, my presentation with just sort of a, an overview of some of the trends that we're seeing uh, in some of the, the, the key uh, outdoor, outdoor products and key sourcing trends uh, that we're seeing. Um, so I know I put a lot of data on this screen. We'll, you'll be able to get a copy of the slides um, to be able to review more closely. But just to highlight a, a couple of points, first here on recreation performance outerwear. Um, between 2017 and 2019, uh, the value of imports from China of uh, recreational performance outerwear decreased by 9%, um, but they increased by 35% out of Vietnam, increased by 53% coming out of Indonesia. And in Indonesia and Vietnam, again, they, they still face uh, the same import tariffs, um, but you see growth in sourcing of performance outerwear out of those uh, two countries. Um, 
as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak in 2020, so looking at year-to-date numbers of 2020, value of performance outerwear imports from China down by 41%, and others are also down. I think you see Bangladesh is up by 5%. Um, so the impact there as a result of COVID-2019, but the trends are in the direction of, of diversifying uh, supply chain of those, those products out of China. Next, looking at protective active footwear, the, the footwear um, uh, that we discussed earlier, um, year to date, looking at the year to date numbers. So in 2020, uh, the imports, the value of imports, uh, protective active footwear from Vietnam are up 43%. Uh, from Cambodia, they're up 20.6%. Um, so down slightly from China, but significant growth uh, in, in those two countries um, year to date in, in 2020. And again, with the import tariffs still uh, remaining in place uh, on those products. Travel goods, this is the great story. And this is one that, as I said, we really try to emphasize to our members, if you're sourcing um, travel goods, you wanna take a look at GSP countries. The growth of uh, travel goods from GSP countries over the past several years has been significant. Um, so while the value of uh, travel good imports from China over between 2017 and 2019 decreased um, by almost 30%, uh, you saw the value increase from Vietnam by 16%. And look at Cambodia and Indonesia. Cambodia up 300% uh, between 2017 and 2019. Indonesia 227% and the Philippines up 45%. Um, year to date, uh, you know, the, the numbers in China are, are down uh, 37%, um, but year to date they're up uh, in Cambodia 60%. And I say year to date, so 2020 compared to 2019. Um, value of imports up 16% in Cambodia, 46.6% in Indonesia. So I think you've seen a clear tie between duty-free treatment on travel goods uh, from GSP eligible countries like Cambodia and Indonesia. Um, so here's a, a group of tents. Again, you've seen growth uh, on tents um, out of Vietnam between 2017 and 2019 up 25%. South Korea free trade uh, partner up 25%. Um, and while we've seen a decrease overall in uh, tents year to date in 2020 compared to 2019, uh, the value of imports on tents from South Korea, again, is up to 121%. Uh, percent. So as I said, a free trade partner. And lastly, uh, sleeping bags. Um, as we've seen, um, Vietnam is significantly up, way up uh, between 2017 and 2019. The value of imports of Vietnam up uh, dramatically. Uh, Burma, uh, another GSP country, up. 44.6% uh, and year to date, the numbers are still increasing. Um, year to date uh, in 2020, Vietnam up 241%, Burma up 983%, Cambodia 250% compared to uh, the year before. So you're seeing some diversity uh, in the supply chain uh, for those products um, and China's share uh, go down. I should emphasize for a lot of outdoor products, however, China still remains uh, the best option and country and companies will still have to manage uh, the impact of any punitive tariffs on those products coming out of China. Um, so I want to conclude there. That's, that's, you have my contact information. Um, if you're following me on Twitter, uh, do so after you follow the president on Twitter to get the latest trade updates. I try to do my best to get them out to the outdoor uh, industry folks as soon as possible. And you can learn more about outdoor industry um, at our website, outdoorindustry.org. So I greatly appreciate your time um, and happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Rich. That was a very detailed and a load of information. So very valuable information. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions for Rick? Don't see any here. That's generally a sign that it was very thorough. <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually what that means, yeah. Um, anyway, so um, Rich, thank you again so much. Thank uh, you. We look, for we look forward to having you back in November for in our, in our Canada show. So look forward to actually getting with you in person this time. Absolutely, around. Look, I look forward yeah. to that. Well, thank you so much. All right, you, you take care. Thank you everybody for watching. Have a good one. Take care, bye-bye. <laughs>